so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. And so considering Mr Bathurst's conclusion that he is firmly of the view that there is reasonable doubt as to Ms Falbig's guilt, I consider that his reasons establish exceptional circumstances of the kind that weigh heavily in favour of the grant of a free pardon, and that in the interest of justice, Ms Falbig should be released from custody as soon as possible. And so uh, this morning at 9.30, I met with the Governor. I recommended that the Governor should exercise the raw prerogative of mercy and grant Ms Falbig an unconditional pardon. The Governor agreed. Hey, it's producer Gia dropping into your true crime conversations feed because after 20 years behind bars, Kathleen Folbig has been pardoned and will be released from prison. A landmark inquiry saw the top prosecutor in New South Wales accept that there was reasonable doubt about her convictions. If you're not aware of Kathleen's story, you're about to hear our episode with Gemma Bath speaking to investigative journalist Jane Hansen, who unpacked the forensic evidence that was to be examined in the inquiry the evidence that has now led to Kathleen Folbig's freedom. June 3, 1990. This was the day that Patrick Allen David Folbig was born. I had mixed feelings this day, whether or not I was going to cope as a mother or whether I was going to get stressed out like I did last time. I often regret Caleb and Patrick, only because your life changes so much and... Maybe I'm not a person who likes change, but we will see. June 18, 1996. I'm ready this time, and I know I'll have help and support this time. When I think I'm going to lose control, like last time, I'll just hand baby over to someone else. I have learnt my lesson this time. January 1, 1997. I have a baby on the way which means major personal sacrifice for both of us. I'm going to call for help this time and not attempt to do everything myself anymore. I know that was the main reason for all my stress before and stress made me do terrible things. February 4, 1997. Still can't sleep. Seem to be thinking of Patrick and Sarah and Caleb. My guilt for how responsible I feel for them all haunts me. My fear of it happening again haunts me. On February 27th, 1999, it did happen again. Kathleen and Craig Folbig lost their fourth child, their daughter Laura, at 18 months old. She lived the longest of all their babies. The others died at 19 days old, 8 months old and 10 months old. Their deaths resulted in a police investigation that saw Kathleen arrested and charged with murder and manslaughter, earning her the title of Australia's most hated woman and the country's worst female serial killer. But now, in 2022, 151 scientists think otherwise and they're fighting to clear her name. Did Kathleen kill her babies? Or has she spent the last 19 years in prison, an innocent woman? Kathy, did you kill Kyla? No! Did you kill Patrick? No! Did you try to kill Patrick on that near miss episode? (laughs) No! Did, Did you kill Sarah? No! And did you kill Laura? No! I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. And before we get into today's case, just a note that this episode contains discussions of child murder. Joining me today is investigative journalist Jane Hanson. Jane is a senior reporter for the Sunday Telegraph and recently released the Mother's Guilt podcast, which delves into the story of Kathleen Folbig. I interviewed Jane last week in the lead up to a second inquiry into the convictions of Kathleen, who has spent almost two decades in prison after being found guilty of killing her four children. She has always 
maintained her innocence. Jane, what do we know about Kathleen and Craig Folbig's life before kids? She went to Katara High. She had a group of girlfriends who called themselves nerds. And she was a foster child. She was fostered out by Neville and Deirdre Marlborough. And she entered their home at age three. And it was a very strict upbringing. And she clashed with her foster mother when she was in year 12 because her friends were going out on the weekend and Deidre was very strict and wouldn't let her. So Kathleen moved out at 18 and moved into a friend's place, Billy Jo Bradshaw's home. Billy Jo lived with her mother. And while she was there, she went out to discos in Newcastle, as she did in the 80s or I did, (laughs) carbon dating myself here. She met Craig Felbig at a Newcastle nightclub and just was besotted with him. She raved about him, that he was a good dancer, that he smelt nice. And within two years, they were married. So she married at age 20. Craig was six years older than her. He worked at BHP and they got a little house in Mayfield, which is a suburb of Newcastle. And within... A year, Kathleen was pregnant with her first child, Caleb. So this is 1989 when she has her first child, Caleb. Do we know much about that pregnancy? Had they been trying for a child? They had been trying and it came very easily and it was a very standard pregnancy, but she'd had an epidural and this is what I know from reading reports, psychiatric Mm -hmm. reports about her. She had an epidural and she felt that that interfered with her birth and it was a forceps delivery and... Apart from that, the baby was born healthy. Within the first couple of days, they noticed that the baby had difficulty taking a bottle and breathing. He would stop breathing and then suck on the bottle and then stop breathing again and and, and do that. So he was diagnosed with a floppy larynx. Now, that's the tissue around your windpipe that can collapse on your windpipe. And that is in the literature as being associated with sudden infant death. That is known. And at 19 days of age, he was found in his crib, floppy and blue, and they tried to revive him, but he had died. What do we know about that day? Was was it just Kathleen that was with him that raised the alarm? Was Craig there too? Yeah, Craig was asleep. Kathleen tended the baby in the morning, early morning, and found him dead. She found all the babies. Craig was a heavy sleeper. And in fact, the Crown used that in their opening address as one of the reasons why she resented her children, because she always had to get up to them while Craig slept through. But yeah, she found each of the children, which was one of the reasons they accused her of being guilty of killing them, smothering them. Yeah, so Kathleen and Craig, they lost three more children in the following Mm -hmm. years. None of them lived beyond 19 or so months. Patrick, Sarah and Laura's deaths, were they also initially attributed to SIDS or a cot death? In the autopsy reports, Caleb's death was put down as sudden infant death. Patrick died at age eight months from epileptic seizures. That's in his autopsy report. Now, Kathleen was found guilty of manslaughter with Patrick because he had possibly had his first epileptic fit at four months. But The Crown argued that that was a failed smothering attempt, which is interesting because they took him to hospital and he was found to have encephalitis. So even looking back on that, I don't know how they made that stick. So the case had problems to begin with. Sarah was found to have died of sudden infant death. There was evidence given in the first trial that she had an enlarged uvula, which is a fleshy thing at the back of your throat, and Laura was found to have died with myocarditis. Now, myocarditis is heart inflammation, swelling of the heart, heart inflammation, and has been linked to deaths, of course. And the pathologist that conducted that autopsy knew that three other children had died in the family, so he marked her death undetermined and then said he couldn't rule out homicide because three other deaths had happened in the family. So this is where the infamous Sir Roy Meadows and Meadows Law came into the trial through the back door. And for those that don't know, Roy Meadows was this paediatrician in the UK who theorised that one sudden infant death was a tragedy, two was suspicious, three was murder until proven otherwise. And his 
testimony given in many, many trials in the UK during the late 1990s and early 2000s convicted a lot of innocent women who had tragically lost babies to sudden infant death. Three in particular, Trupti Patil, Sally Clark and Angela Cannings, and there was one other, Donna Anthony. After it was found to be bumpkin, like just nonsense, those women, their convictions were quashed. But Sally Clark, even though she got out of jail, she never recovered. She died two years later from alcohol poisoning because it's one thing to lose two children. In her case, she lost two children, but another to be blamed for it. And, yeah, she never recovered. So by the time these four deaths had happened to Kathleen and Craig, was Meadows Law still being used as a rule of thumb or had it been no, discredited? No, I mean, in fact... The Crown was very, very careful not to mention Meadows Law uh, Mm -hmm. because at the time in 2003 when Kathleen's trial was being held, all these cases in the UK were falling over and it was a huge controversy that the opinion of one man could cause so much damage in these women's lives. But it entered the back door in the Folby case because all the medical experts that gave evidence were asked, have you ever seen a family that's had four sub-infant deaths? And they all said no. So there was that suspicion. And then the pathologist gave his evidence that he'd never seen it before. And other pathologists said, well, we've never seen it before either. So there was this idea that if you couldn't find an answer, blame it on the woman. And of course, there were her diaries, which were incriminating, didn't include any sort of overt admission of guilt, but did talk about regret and sorrow and how much stress she had and how she wasn't coping some days and that she felt responsible for the deaths of her children. Those diaries that you mentioned, were they the first kind of time police became properly involved in this case? Well, Craig found the diaries and he gave the diaries to police, but police were already investigating because the pathologist had said in his report, I can't rule out homicide. Police should investigate whether there's a homicide. Craig and Kathleen, their marriage had been rocky. You could imagine after losing three children, they'd already separated a couple of times. By the time they had Laura and then after she died, you know, they were estranged at that point. He found the diaries, he gave them to police and he felt some of the entries were suspicious. Can you talk us through some of the main passages from those diaries that do kind of spark that inference of guilt? that people talk about? Yeah, so she talked about how stress made her do terrible things, how she lost it with Laura one day and and nearly dropped her and took her out of the high chair, put her on the ground and let her scream and then went into the bedroom for five minutes. And she wrote, I've finally done it, I've lost it. She also wrote that she felt terribly guilty and she felt like a terrible mother because three of her children had died and she felt like a failure because three of her children had died. She wrote that she didn't deserve to have another child because three of her children had died. And in the 2019 inquiry, Margaret Canine put all these entries to her and Kathleen, for the first time, we got to hear her speak and try and explain these diary entries. And her explanation was, well, yes, I, I felt I was responsible for the death of my children because I'm their mother and they died. And she talked about how she felt so guilty about it and how her thoughts and her actions made her children on some sort of metaphysical level decide to leave her. Now, what's interesting about that kind of journaling is that any mother that's lost a child blames themselves. It's very, very common, and I've been there myself. You know, I've lost two sons. One was stillborn and another I lost at eight months. And that was shortly after Kathleen Folby was found guilty. So... At the time, I thought, it nearly killed me, how did she lose four and why is she still alive if she's lost four or if she was innocent? But my diary entries read very similar about what a monumental failure I am and if only I hadn't done this and if only I hadn't done that. And, and, you know, in some parts of my diary I talk about karma, you know, because of some things I'd done in my career hadn't gone well and, you know, maybe this was payback that my son died. So... We do know, you know, Professor Emma Cunliffe is a professor of law and she wrote Murder, Medicine and Motherhood and she looked through Kathleen Folbig's diaries extensively and she then looked into maternal grief 
and found that this self-blame is standard behaviour of bereaved parents, especially bereaved mothers. And like her diaries are on the website for anyone to read. They're on the Department of Justice website. And you can wade through them and you, and you see when you read them that, well, one, they're kind of mundane. She's, she talks a lot about gaining weight after having children and, and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, and those, those little tiny bits of worry that were picked out during the trial, when you put them all together, it sounded very, very suspicious. But if you read the thing, in total, you'll have a different view, I'd say. 2003, it doesn't feel like it was that long ago, but it was a fair while ago when you consider the way society talks about motherhood now or, you know, even things like postnatal depression or how people feel in those first few months after motherhood. Do you think that even those kinds of conversations we were lacking in that nuance back then as well? I've got the Crown's opening case here and I just want to read this to you because I wonder whether it would fly in 2022. So this was 2003. This is Mark Tedeschi to the jury. She was constantly tired, resentful against her husband Craig for not providing her with what she considered to be adequate sleep and she was constantly preoccupied to an exaggerated degree with her weight gain due in part to the fact she couldn't get to the gym as much as she liked because of her children the Crown's case is that she either intended to kill them during a flash of anger, resentment or hatred against her children, or alternatively, that she deliberately sought to render them unconscious in an attempt to put them to sleep, either so that she could get off to sleep herself or that she could have some time to herself. Now, when I read that, I thought, okay, I'm pretty sure lots of mothers have felt like that in the past. Does that make them murder their children? I don't think so. You know, I I thought at the time, why would you keep having children if you thought they got in the way of your life? Why would you put your body through a pregnancy? And so it always seemed weird to me that she'd keep having babies just to suffocate them. But this was the Crown's case as to her motive. It's bizarre. One of the diary entries that got a lot of attention was where she talked about, obviously, I'm my father's daughter. Can you give us the context as to why that was so important to the prosecution? So Kathleen Folbig was born into the most horrific domestic violence. Her father was a standover man, a wife abuser. He'd already been found guilty of slashing the throat of his previous wife. And Kathleen's mother, Kathleen Donovan, he stabbed her to death 24 times on a street in Annandale. And Kathleen was only 18 months at the time. She was then bounced around family members and the doc's reports at the time, the Family and Community Services reports at the time, found the child had likely been sexually abused by the father as well. So when she wrote in her diary that she felt like she was her father's daughter, in the 2019 cross-examination, Margaret Keneen put it to Kathleen Folbig that that meant she's her father's daughter because she killed her children and he killed his mother. And then she explained, quite rationally, I think, that she always considered her father a loser And that because he was a loser and because he'd done that, that that had impacted on her life and made her a loser, which, you know, if you understand complex trauma, which obviously she went through in the early years of her life before she was pre-verbal, that kind of explains that. There's going to be evidence given to that effect in February when the psychology of the diaries is examined in the new inquiry. In this first instance where she was convicted, was there any other evidence other than the diaries and the things that we've mentioned, you know, physical evidence that tied her to any of these crimes? No. There was no physical evidence that any of the children had been smothered. None. But smothering doesn't really leave much evidence, but none of the children had indentations on their faces or fibres in their throats. Laura was 18 and almost 19 months old. You would think that she would have put up a fight. All of the pathologists in the 2019 inquiry agreed that there was no evidence that any of the children had suffered any sorts of abuse, physical abuse beforehand. They were all chubby, well-looked after, well-dressed, beautiful children. It was an entirely circumstantial case because she was the one that found the children 
And then, in fact, that's another thing she wrote about in her diary, that she felt scared to be alone with the children. This was used against her, as in, yes, because you don't trust yourself, you're going to kill your children. But she explained that she was scared to find them dead because it was always her that found her children dead. And she wished that Craig had been one of the parents to have found them dead. What about postnatal illness? Do we know if she had anything diagnosed or was suffering with that? She has had psychiatric assessments and there is some indication that she possibly had postnatal depression with Caleb, Mm -hmm. but they found no evidence of any sort of psychosis or disassociation that would make you kill a child. No evidence of that. The jury in 2003 was unanimous in her guilt. In a completely circumstantial case, how? (laughs) How was the prosecution able to get that? Well, I think the Crown put up a good case. I think they dismissed some of the stuff really well that was there. And, in fact, I've got the closing argument here. This is Mark Tedeschi again. Lightning doesn't strike four times. He made that point. Caleb may have died from a floppy larynx or SIDS. Patrick might have had an acute life-threatening event, which was his first epileptic attack, or encephalitis. Remember, that was at four months. His death may have been caused by an epileptic attack or an epileptic seizure. Sarah may have had a displaced uvula or SIDS. Laura might have died of myocarditis. Well, yes, ladies and gentlemen, I can't disprove any of that. But one day some piglets might be born from a sow and the piglets might come out of the sow with wings on their backs. And the next morning, Farmer Joe might look out the window and see these pigs flying out of his farm. So he basically said that, yes, all of these things actually did happen and could explain sudden infant death, but also pigs fly. It almost sounds like he's using Meadows' law without saying Meadows' law. (laughs) Yeah, many people have said it's come through the back door. Mm. Yep. Mm. Kathleen was sentenced to 40 years in prison for murder with a non-parole of 30 years, which was reduced to 25 years on appeal. At the time, what was the public reaction to that result? The case did divide the nation. I do remember that. The headlines read, monstrous, Australia's most hated woman. There was very much a little bit of Lindy Chamberlain going on as well because she did not come across the way a grieving mother's supposed to come across. She wasn't bawling her eyes out. She wasn't hysterical. And so there is a bit of a comparison to be made there of of women not behaving in the way that we expect bereaved mothers to behave. And I have to say I've had a little bit of that myself. After I lost my son, I wrote a book. And I did some media and I went and did an interview in Melbourne with David Rain and and Kim Watkins. It was Good Morning Melbourne or something like that. And and I was talking about the loss of my son. And and David Rain said to me, why aren't you crying? (laughs) And I said, well, I'm actually really trying hard to keep it together here. Because if I lose it, Kim's going to lose it. And plus, you know, you can't cry 24 hours a day. You know, after several years of grief, it just exhausts you. You do shut down. And you do, oh, you disassociate in a way so that you can exist, so that you can, you know, carry on pretty much. I don't think armchair experts realise as well what it might be like to sit in a dock and have the world watching you while you try and do that grieving. And people grieve differently, you know. Mm-hmm. Who are we to, to judge somebody else's nightmare? What about Craig, her husband? Did he think she was guilty at this point? He supported her all the way through, all the way through. And and I've seen some of the listening devices conversations that happened when Kathleen was being investigated by police. And he's, you know, they've both been saying, well, why are they blaming you, Kathleen? So, you know, he obviously supported her all the way through until he found the diaries. But at this stage, they were estranged. Jane, You've mentioned a few things that allude to a fairly relatable mental state and thought process that women struggle with in the early days of being a mother and in the aftermath of losing a child. Do you think there's an element of the legal system being stacked with men that plays against her in this case? Yes, I think there has been throughout history many cases of men accusing women of doing things when there's no clear answer. That goes right back to the burning witches at the stake stuff. And in this case, you know, here we have a woman who, who's lost four children and she's been 
skewered by the law when perhaps we should have had compassion for her. Dr. Robert Moles talks about there's a lot of patriarchy in the current legal system. Even Professor Cordner, the pathologist Professor Stephen Cordner, says with regards to sudden infant death syndrome, why do we have to insert certainty into an area where there is uncertainty? And that certainty was pure circumstantial evidence. Well, it just goes to show how having more women at the table, more women in positions of power when it comes to this kind of stuff, because how can men possibly understand, you know, a woman's experience with motherhood? Exactly. And that thing with men and women and how they grieve differently, you know, maternal grief very much centres on self-blame. I'm a mother. My job is to keep my child alive. My child died. I'm at fault. I've failed. That's pretty standard maternal bereavement journaling. And, you know, academics have studied this. Men are more likely not to keep a journal. And, you know, I don't want to completely stereotype here, but they're less likely to write about it and talk about it. And centre themselves in it as the person to blame. Yeah. Yeah. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with investigative journalist and podcast host Jane Hansen about the death of Kathleen Folbig's four children. I want to skip forward to 2015. So the New South Wales Governor received a petition for a review of Kathleen's convictions. Mm. Why was that? That was because the Attorney General said, look, the original trial was based on the fact that one or more sudden infant deaths is unheard of, and that's plainly untrue. So Folbig's lawyers did argue that that came into the trial and that that was wrong and it shouldn't have been framed that way. And so an inquiry was called, but also they had some explosive evidence from another pathologist called Professor Stephen Cordner, who at the time was running the Victorian Institute of Forensic Science. And he'd gone through the pathologists and autopsy reports, and he sent slides of Laura's heart. Laura was the fourth one that died of myocarditis. He sent off slides to 10 different pathologists, didn't tell them who it was so that there was no bias, and asked them to determine the cause of death. They all came back and said, cause of death is myocarditis. 10 out of 10, 100% of them said that the cause of death is myocarditis. Alan Carla, the original pathologist who did Laura's autopsy, didn't rule myocarditis on the basis that three other children had died in the family. So that was pretty explosive. And then in 2019, it took four years for that inquiry to get up, Alan Carla actually finally admitted, yes, myocarditis could have been the reason she died. At that point, Volvic's lawyers thought case closed. But no, Justice Blanche still reaffirmed her guilt based on the diaries. Even though this new evidence, this new genetic evidence, had just come in at the end of that inquiry. Because the inquiry started in around October 2018 and then this new evidence you're talking about was in the December. So to explain to listeners, that's not enough time for them to actually use that in the inquiry, is it? What had happened is that Folbig's lawyers had sent off some DNA of Kathleen Folbig to the Australian National University geneticist, Dr. Carola Finwaiser. She and her colleague, Tudor Ossoff, they got blood spot samples from the two girls, Laura and Sarah, and the boys as well. They only had Kathleen's DNA, and they found this mutation on what's known the CALM2 gene. Now, there's three CALM genes in the human body, and I'm going to try and make this as simple as possible because it's complex <laughs> science. The CALM modulin genes, CALM for short, there's three CALM genes and mutations on these genes are linked to sudden cardiac arrhythmias and deaths, things like long QT syndrome and CMVT is another disease. Both cause cardiac arrhythmias. So when they found that the children had inherited this mutation from Kathleen, it was stopped the presses and they tried to explain that the mutation was probably the likely cause. This is in 2019. But at that point, there was argument between the other scientific experts and cardiologists in the inquiry that they didn't know whether that mutation was pathogenic, i.e. causes disease. 
it just came in a little too late. Now, that science was kind of ignored, actually, and Judge Blanche found Kathleen's guilt reaffirmed because of the diaries. At that point, they sent the findings over to Professor Peter Schwartz, who is a world-leading expert in long QT syndrome, and he's been studying its link with sudden infant deaths for 50 years. And he has a register, he set up a register of CALM genes, people with those mutations on their CALM genes, and there's like 131 people on that register. So it does happen. It's not lightning strikes four times, it does happen. So at that point, more scientists got involved and decided to test the science. So some scientists in Denmark isolated the mutation, began making the proteins with this mutation so that they could test it. And then they, using the Folbig mutation, they found that this mutation did indeed interrupt calcium's ability to bind. Now, calcium's ability to bind to a protein is what keeps our heart regular. If you have a mutation on your CALM genes that interrupts that, you are at high risk of sudden death or a cardiac arrest. And in fact, people die all the time of cardiac arrests under the age of 50. And now there is screening. Anyone that dies of of a cardiac arrest who is young is now genetically screened, as is their family, to find if they are carrying these genes that link to long QT syndrome. And in fact, I did a story not that long ago about a young mum. She was 32 and she had a cardiac arrest. She just put down her previous symptoms of of tiredness and fainting to the fact she was a new mother. So she was found to have a gene that caused long QT syndrome. So was her baby daughter and so was her mother. And the older ones are fitted with a pacemaker and the baby is now on beta blockers. So this is the thing. So when those Danish researchers found that this mutation did in fact cause disease, this paper was published in 2021. And the science is so compelling that at that stage, 90 international scientists signed the petition, a new petition, to release Kathleen Folby based on the fact that two of the girls likely died of a cardiac arrhythmia event that killed them. There's now 151 signatures on that petition. And that's why we're having this new inquiry because that petition to the Attorney General presented by Folbig's lawyers and there's 151 scientists, very eminent scientists, the Attorney General had to advise the Governor to hold a new inquiry to hear this science. So this particular gene mutation, it can explain the girls, but what about the boys? Well, Craig Folbig hasn't given his DNA. So they didn't find this mutation on the boys. There could be another mutation linked to epilepsy, which they have found in the boys that is related to animal models. But the thing is, if all four cases were tried together, so she was found guilty of smothering four children, if two of them are found to have died of natural causes, the whole case falls over. So legal experts I've spoken to in the podcast have said, well, if that's the case, the current conviction as it is can't stand, it either has to be dropped or it goes back to the Court of Criminal Appeal. To have 151 scientists, and probably still climbing, (laughs) saying that this woman should be released, that's a pretty remarkable thing to happen. According to Dr Robert Moles, who's an expert in miscarriages of justice, I spoke to him and he said it's unprecedented. Like you might get one or two experts in a retrial to go, oh, yeah, okay, acquitted. 151? Unprecedented, he says. That's why it's such a showdown. It's science versus the law. And, uh, you know, the law's been pretty slow to get their head around the science because we're talking about lawyers who get uh, medical experts. So this is why the Australian Academy of Science has been granted leave to actually advise the lawyers on what's appropriate questioning with regards to the science to try and help everyone understand the science because it's complex it's complex for me to try and explain you know to the layperson what these mutations do and even with all of this science behind it do you think there's still a chance that what happened with the first inquiry happens here or are you pretty confident and are the experts pretty confident that we'll see a different result 
I'm pretty confident that the science is overwhelming <laughs> and that that's hard to argue with. And, uh, yeah, gosh, if she's still found to be guilty, I think serious questions need to be asked about the legal system. If what happened to her children, her and Craig's children, happened today, you touched on it before, but how differently would it have been treated in our modern world? You mentioned that there are things like genetic testing that yeah. she wouldn't have been you know, given the opportunity to have. They actually did have genetic testing after Patrick died, after the second child died. They did have genetic testing, but this was back in the 90s and the human genome wasn't mapped yet mm. to the full extent that it is now. So nothing was found. But she was of the belief that she had some genetic problem. I mean, she'd said that to an ambulance officer after the third child died, her daughter Sarah. She said, I thought I carried a genetic fault that only killed boys. So she was aware that something was wrong. Yeah, but, you know, two decades on, scientific evidence is very, very precise these days. It's not like in 2003, oh, you know, dear doctor, have you seen four deaths in a family before? No, I haven't. I've never seen it. That's not evidence anymore. Yeah. There's so much more science involved now. And in fact, what we know after having spoken to sudden infant death experts recently during this podcast, is if you've had one sudden infant death, your chances of having another one are 40% higher because of the link with genetics. I think one study found that 11% of sudden infant deaths have a genetic cause. So if you have two in a family, it's much more likely there's a genetic issue at play, much more likely than homicide, you know, crazed mothers tired and smothering their children to get a good night's sleep. It's much more plausible that it's a genetic issue. I want to talk about Kathleen a bit more and what she's been going through the last 19 years. Do we know much about how her life in prison has been? I've never met her. <laughs> you know, I've written to her, but I specifically went out of my way to go and speak to her girlfriends, her girl squad from school. Because I know what my girlfriends from school know about me. And I thought long and hard about these friends that you keep throughout a lifetime. And Kathleen has a squad of girls that are so loyal to her and unshaking in their belief that she is innocent. So I wanted to find out who the real Kathleen was. So, you know, I had long discussions with these friends. They all adore her. Billy Joe says that Kathleen stood up for her at school, stood up to the bullies, that she was a little bit feisty when it came to standing up to her foster mother. She was devastated when she found out about the truth of her father and her biological mother much later in life. She didn't find out till she was a teenager. That she's remained a friend to all these women, even though Billy Joe admitted to having a fling with her husband. <laughs> in fact, she caught them. Uh, she's forgiven her. And, yeah, Tracy Chapman is the one that stays in touch with her daily, speaks to her daily. So she originally went into solitary isolation because of the risk to her. And she has been beaten up a couple of times. She's now in the Grafton Jail, the Clarence Correctional Facility, and she reports that things have settled down and that people are starting to believe her. What do you make of this case, having studied it, researched it, talked to everyone involved? Oh, well, I think anyone that looks into the case deeply sees that there were big issues from the start mm -hmm. with the case. Big holes, you know, even Patrick, her being found guilty of manslaughter when likely his first acute life-threatening event was his first seizure. I mean, this is the pattern of epilepsy in children. They'll have a seizure in the first few months of their life. In this case, Patrick ended up blind and then he died of intractable seizures some months later. How the prosecution argued that that was a failed smothering, when he went to hospital, it was he was found to have encephalitis of some unknown cause and other evidence was given that it was likely his first epileptic fit. Well, that, that creates reasonable doubt in itself. And then that whole, you know, lightning doesn't strike four times, that sneaky Meadows law through the back door. Yeah, big issues. But also Laura having myocarditis. I mean, each of the children had issues. Each of the children could have died of any of the other things that they were also diagnosed with. There was 
scientific evidence of that. No scientific evidence of smothering, but people have gone with that story. We mentioned before that if this conviction is upheld, there'll be questions to be asked about the justice system. But even if it is overturned and there is reasonable doubt that she did not murder her children, it does feel very reminiscent to the Lindy Chamberlain case and Mm. either way it feels like it's going to erode the people's trust in Mm. the way our justice system works. Yeah, I've spoken to quite a few legal academics that have said that there is a problem with the way evidence is presented that needs to be addressed. And and this inquiry, it will have ramifications for other cases, especially with the Australian Academy of Science being granted leave as a third party to advise how science should be applied within the court and heard within the court. That's going to have ramifications for many cases beyond Kathleen Folbig's. Lindy Chamberlain spent three years in jail. Kathleen spent 19 years. So if the conviction's overturned, uh, yeah, this will be an extraordinary moment in legal history. Thanks to Jane for assisting us to tell this story. News Corp's latest true crime podcast, Mother's Guilt, hosted by Jane, is available now. The first five episodes focus on the history of Kathleen's case And episode six, which will be released this Saturday, will take you through the big findings from the inquiry. We'll put a link to listen in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath. The executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you've loved listening today, become part of the community that makes you feel seen, heard and understood like never before. Subscribe to Mamma Mia. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.